Welcome everybody. Today we will be talking about a more active regulatory environment that we're expecting to see under new SEC Chair Gary Gensler, specifically in the areas of cybersecurity, privacy, and ESG. We have a great and experienced speaker lineup for you today for today's topics. I would like to introduce Christian Kelly, Chief Technology Officer at Xantrion, which provides cybersecurity and IT support services to help protect firms from cyber attacks and help them be prepared for SEC and FINRA exams. Thank you, Christian, for speaking today. And thank you very much to Xantrion for being an associate member of the IAA and for sponsoring today's webinar. Next, we have Marina Taskova. Marina is a head of privacy and cybersecurity at Armanino LLP, an audit, tax, and consulting firm. Marina specializes in complex privacy and cybersecurity matters. And finally, I'd like to welcome Sean Wilkie from Grayline, which specializes in governance, risk, and compliance services. Grayline also offers outsourced CFO, accounting, and operational support to the investment management industry through its GCM advisory division. So welcome everyone and thank you for being here today. So let's begin with a discussion of cybersecurity. Ransomware attacks continue to make headlines as many of us can attest by seeing long lines at the gas stations last week. Christian, what are your tips for protecting organizations against ransomware attacks? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. We, um, it's definitely something that's top of mind, uh, especially with everything in the news, as you said. Um, we, you know, we have dealt with companies who have had um, various forms of ransomware attacks or, or um, other types of breaches where financial loss is, is uh, part of it. And we feel um, that having a, a layered security approach is really the first step. Um, a lot of times people will look for some silver bullet, some fancy kind of shiny new box that will protect them. And, and, and not saying that uh, you know, these different types of technologies don't play a part, but having a strong foundation of security um, and a layered security approach is what we have seen be most effective uh, in warding off these types of attacks. Um, we look at, you know, we, we take special care around, you know, authentication, really understanding the full authentication and kind of identity of users as being kind of a primar primary way of, you know, making sure that we can understand who's logging in, logging into what, and understanding anomalies um, around uh, those types of attacks. Uh, endpoint security continues to be a, a, a primary focus um, in thwarting these types of attacks, having good endpoint protection, having good control of the devices that the users um, are interacting with. And obviously end user training is a big piece of it. Um, we see a lot of times basic things being skipped and you know, maybe uh, companies going after something that, again, it's not that those types of technologies can't help, but if you miss or kind of overlook basic security uh, controls, it can, uh, it can really come back to bite you. So, um, you know, really looking at your whole security program, making sure it's holistic, making sure you're not missing any um, basic protections is something that we definitely uh, look at. Um, moving to, to backups, obviously that is a big, uh, it, it comes in heavily when, when you're talking about a ransomware attack. Um, so having good air gap backups, is something that I can't stress enough. A lot of these uh, ransomware attacks, um, the, you know, the attacker gains some kind of persistent um, access to the network and takes time to understand what backup systems are in place. And in most cases, we'll go after those backups and delete those backups. Um, and so having something that, you know, picture yourself being an administrator on the backup server can you fully delete the backups, right? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Are you gonna have a copy of backups that is completely immune to anything that an attacker might do um, on the system? So that's, that's something you want to, to take into account and really understand um, if, you know, are you backing up all of your systems? We see that a lot as well, where a backup policy might be put into place and it's not audited or reviewed. So when push comes to shove, 
um, you know, maybe some systems weren't included in backups or the backups were failing or corrupt in some way and um, that impacts the, the, the client greatly. Uh, reviewing your cyber insurance security policy is something we're really starting to see um, insurance companies get very specific um, where they're starting to call out ransomware insurance as a secondary kind of auxiliary uh, agreement. Um, but, you know, I think that insurance companies are paying out a lot of, of ransoms now and they're starting to try to understand and, and figure out how they can get away uh, from having to pay that insurance. So we're starting in the last few months, we've started to see very specific questionnaires about what exactly companies are doing, um, you know, what type of access end users have to their own systems, are they administrators, um, you know, how many global admins are there in your network, you know, are there any users with global admin permissions, like very specific questions where typically uh, insurance questionnaires were more, you know, do you have endpoint protection or do you have backups, they're starting to get very specific. Um, and then um, obviously, you know, to answer those questions, you have to be very careful that you don't kind of overextend kind of a hopeful yes, like, yes, we kind of are doing that. So we're going to put a yes. You want to be very careful in, you know, if you're not completely fulfilling what they're asking to put a no, because in the end, if you put a yes, and it turns out that that was the vector for attack, that they're going to point to that and likely not pay out um, the insurance claim. So, Keep, keep an eye on those insurance policies as they come in, as, as they start getting renewed, and, you're, and likely you're going to start seeing changes in those. Um, and then finally, have solid operational processes in place. We've seen examples uh, very recently, actually, where a client might have very good security controls, breach detection capability, um, you know, multi-factor everywhere, legacy protocols disabled, all of the things that you would expect but because of some kind of lax operational uh, policies with onboarding users, for example, reusing passwords, or, you know, even if MFA is in place, reusing passwords can create a vector for an attacker to get in early into the process, maybe even before the user is fully onboarded and, and, and gain multi-factor access, things like that. So having really good uh, operational policies in place that mesh with your security policies is something that we um, see as, as, as vitally important into protecting. All right, thanks, Christian. And another cyber incident that has been in the news recently was the Microsoft Exchange mass hack. Can you explain a little bit about what that involved and what are your tips for responding to an incident like that? Absolutely. Um, so this was, you know, within the last few months, there was a vulnerability um, in Exchange servers, uh, email servers, which you know, there's a lot of, and um, it, it was a vulnerability that was being targeted uh, to very specific companies. But once Microsoft released the patch and um, uh, ma made that patch available, within hours, um, mass scans were going on and attacks were taking place. So um, it, it's kind of an accelerated timeline to what we normally see, but it was an example of you know, if you're going to continue to have on-premise services um, ex exposed to the internet, things like Exchange, you really have to have a solid and, and rapid patch uh, program in place. And I don't know, I, I think we can move to the next slide if anyone's uh, able to do that. Yeah, so, so having a good patch management strategy um, where you can react quickly is, is vitally important if you're going to keep servers on-prem. The better kind of forward looking solution is to continue to move uh, to native cloud services. Uh, in, in the example of the exchange attack, um, Office 365 was not impacted. Um, so that was an example of, you know, clients who had already kind of made that move were essentially protected from that attack. So it, again, if there's a reason why you still need to have on premise uh, services that you're in control of, you really have to have a good patching strategy where you can react very quickly to these types um, of vulnerabilities that come out. Uh, one kind of side note to that is beware of hybrid deployments. We've, we saw a lot of cases where 
clients have moved to the cloud, uh, for example, with Exchange, right, Office 365, but still had hybrid servers. And even though those hybrid servers didn't need to be exposed to the internet, in a lot of cases they were due to, you know, legacy uh, firewall rules or whatever. So um, we had, a, you know, we saw examples of clients who weren't even, they, there was no reason for that server to be online attacked um, and, and, you know, uh, malware be installed. I mean, thankfully it didn't escalate to a full, a full like ransomware attack or, or anything that uh, had a lot of impact. But again, you know, try to uh, re reduce your attack surface uh, when you move uh, to the cloud. Um, another example of this is where uh, clients move to Azure AD, which is a great authentication kind of um, system. But in some cases, uh, uh, in the same kind of context, an on-premise, uh, what, what's called an ADFS server, a, a kind of a federation server is still online. And that's a vector for very advanced attacks. Some of the um, solar winds kind of uh, attacks, um, you know, obviously came in through the, 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 the solar winds uh, channel, but then used ADFS servers to um, escalate up and get, gain more permissions and, and actually attack Office 365. So be very aware of, you know, moving to cloud service is great. Uh, it, it definitely can uh, in, increase your protection, but don't leave the legacy servers um, in, involved any longer than you absolutely have to. Speaking of solar winds, um, what lessons can be learned from what happened there in terms of working with a managed service provider uh, regarding due diligence on their supply chain. And Megan, uh, we're on the next slide. Absolutely. So the SolarWinds um, uh, attack chain was, was, was a very interesting one. It, it's, it's a difficult, um, you know, th th this type of attack is, is, is difficult, obviously, to fully be able to suss out as you look at um, vendors that you're working with, right? But what is important is that you have a clear vendor due diligence process included in your security plan. You want to um, have under, you know, you want to have documented a documented understanding of when you must or should do a vendor due diligence exercise, right? You, you, it's not all vendors are created equal. Uh, a lot of times in your security policy, you'll have you know different levels of data, right? Different um, levels of importance, of criticality, of privacy, and it's only when a vendor might interact with a certain level of your data that you would require a vendor due diligence package. So, um, you know, definitely have a good uh, understanding of when um, you must do a vendor due diligence process. And then uh, when you do them, you know, we're starting to see more interest around the software development lifecycle, um, how that vendor might be interacting with other vendors um, in the kind of supply chain of what they're using to create their software, um, you know, what, what kind of security uh, processes and programs they have in place to protect themselves. Obviously, as, as you know, vendors have other vendors and those vendors have vendors, it's almost impossible to fully suss out, you know, if something's safe, but it, it, it's worth the effort to understand kind of the security profile of the vendor, how seriously they take it. There are some you know, basics, you know, do they have some kind of uh, att attestation you can look at, some kind of, you know, SOC uh, controls or something in place that you can actually review and kind of understand something that's audited and real. Um, one thing we see with a lot of SaaS-based uh, vendors, especially more startup SaaS-based vendors, is they will, you know, when we start pressing them for information about their programs and their security, they will try to pass on you know, Azure or AWS's, Amazon's kind of security SOC attestation and say, hey, we're on Amazon or, or AWS, so therefore we're secure. It's very important to understand the operator, right? So of course the platform, you know, if it's on AWS or Azure is likely gonna tick any box that you could imagine, but the one who's on, you know, the vendor that's operating it, it that's a different story. So you really want to, um, zero in on the operator and their security controls, whether they require multi-factor, what their patching procedures look like, what their vendor due diligence process is for their upstream providers. Um, that's really where you want to focus less about the platform that it's on, especially if it's on one of the big three. Um, so that's that's something definitely to focus on. And then finally, you know, it's not going to be possible to rule out all supply chain attacks. It's not possible for Microsoft. It's not possible for you know any massive company with unlimited budget to fully suss out 
every vendor and every vendor's vendor and fully understand if something's safe. So, you, you know, as long as you have a program in place, as long as you're doing your due diligence and understanding the vendors and, and whether they're taking security uh, seriously and can kind of come back with some kind of matrix of risk um, versus the, the, the product that you want to use, um, we see that as being a good strategy. Excellent, some great tips there. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit now and talk about some data privacy developments. And Marina, I'll come to you. Um, can you tell us what is happening on the state data privacy law front? Uh, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you everyone for uh, joining. It's an honor to be here. Uh, there is a lot of things going on <laughs> in the field of privacy. I'm sure you heard a lot about privacy. The media lately is very active in res with respect to privacy in the United States, but also globally. Um, this is a very brief, um, I would say, chart that shows you what's happening in the United States in terms of recent privacy development. There are multiple laws that are either active or already passed or uh, uh, laws that are in process to pass. As you can see, introduced bills. There are also failed bills about, uh, about privacy in relation to privacy. Just to, just to um, give a little note before that, um, GDPR, which is the European Data Protection Regulation that has been adopted in, uh, in Europe is one reason for this significant shift in, uh, in the privacy developments around the world. Uh, the adoption of that law led to adoption of multiple privacy laws around the world. And United States uh, stayed aside for a little while, but then afterwards CCPA came, which is the California privacy law, which took um, the example of, of the general data protection regulation and kind of initiated this process of multiple legislative changes um, in, in the field of privacy. Uh, what, what's mattered the most, and I'm going to mention it today, is uh, California and Virginia. As you can see, these are uh, past bills. Other laws that are active are in Connecticut, Alaska, Colorado, Nevada, New Jersey. There are also failed bills, for example, those in South Carolina, Oklahoma, Arizona, Maryland, or North Dakota. Happy to continue with the next slide. Sure. So, um, so of great interest um, to our, our members is what's happening at the, the leader, the states that are really leading the charge for data privacy law. So, you know, what's happening in California and some other states that we should be aware of? Yeah, um, one thing that it's uh, worth mentioning in relation to all these multiple state laws, uh, as you will see, um, there are so many different laws and they're in such a different level of development. It would be a very, it would be very difficult task for a company that it's uh, located either in California or in Texas or in any other state to actually cope with these laws if the organization has global operations. It's also a bit difficult for uh, companies to assess, is that a Virginia resident? Is that a California resident? Because of mo most of these laws are very local. So I believe um, by taking into consideration the current developments and what happened in Europe with uh, multiple countries in European Union and different uh, approach towards privacy is that there would be uh, a federal privacy law. And I believe in Congress, industry, civil society in the White House have all taken step towards the creation of a US federal privacy law. Whether that's gonna happen soon and how this law would look like, these are still very much in question, uh, but it looks more look like that a federal law in the United States uh, will uh, appear. So just bear in mind that there is such possibility. Um, I will speak today about you know, laws which are important simply because they're already, some of them are operative and others would become operative very shortly. Uh, one of them is the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA. It is operating since January 1st, 2020, and forced till July 1st, 2020. But there would be another, uh, we call it CCPA number two, California Privacy Rights Act, which would be operated from January 2023. Um, this law basically became uh, real uh, in November 2020 elections. 
And um, some part of that law is already um, kind of active because, for example, they're creating now data protection agency, something very interesting, which also follows the European approach of the general data protection regulation. Just to mention that in Europe, um, every country has data protection authorities, which kind of enforce um, the um, requirements of the European privacy law. And of course, we also have Virginia Consumer Data Protection Act that is operated from January 1st, 2023 as well. In other words, in the upcoming two years, there would be a lot of developments in the field of privacy, which I believe would impact everyone. You will see a um, huge increase of data protection officer roles, chief privacy officer roles, and even some type of connection between privacy and security, because a lot of the security matters for which Christian talked earlier would have an impact also on privacy, for, for example, in relation to data breaches, notification of data breaches, if these data breaches, to which extent they impact personal information involved, etc. And I know our audience is probably curious about whether there are any exemptions to these laws that might cover SEC registered investment advisors. So um, can you tell us what the latest is there? Yes, um, I would love to, uh, if we can move to the next slide, just for um, be visual understanding. Um, first of all, guys, I am very sorry because the, the letters are quite small, <laughs> and, but this is just for your information purposes. If you want in the future uh, to go back and double check these definitions, as you will see, I uh, specifically underlined uh, GLBA, which is the ground leash Bly Act. And the reason for that is because there's certain exception uh, which uh, concern uh, the GLBA uh, and also the HIPAA for um, healthcare organizations, which exclude certain type of personal data from the scope of these laws. For example, Virginia Consumer Data Protection Act is quite broad and it excludes financial institutions or data subjects subject to Title V of the GLBA. However, this is not the case with the CCPA and the CCPA uh, doesn't exempt financial institutions or financial services businesses. However, it exempts certain types of information that is subject to the GLBA. Also bear in mind that even though um, a lot of uh, big part of the audience are financial institutions uh, or financial services companies, just so you know, I'm pretty sure you are processing. I, and when I say process, I mean use, access, disclose, share, transfer, personal information that doesn't necessarily relate to, to the services that you are providing. One example for that that I could provide is marketing data lists which you could um, which you could obtain or for example personal information about individuals that you obtain prior to uh, an application process or um, personal information that you obtain from non-financial partners and marina i think a lot of people studied the ccpa when it first came out and got familiar with it but then uh, the CPRA came out um, and maybe um, you can help us understand what is different about that. What is going to change once it becomes effective at the beginning of 2023? Next slide. Yeah. Yes, of course. Thank you so much uh, for this. I am focused on the CCPA, on the CPRA, because I believe they're more relevant for uh, the audience today rather than the Virginia law. Bear in mind, Virginia law, um, and I will continue with uh, the both laws here, are very much follows uh, the European General Data Protection Regulation um, um, law. And in relation to California Consumer Privacy Act and California Privacy Rights Act, the, the situation is very similar. There is a, a few changes in relation to scope, which organizations will fall within the scope now in comparison to organizations that will fall in scope in the future. As you can see, for example, businesses, which is basically the entity that looks towards this idea, whether it's in scope or not, if it has gross annual revenues in excess of $25 million or buys, receives, sells, or shares personal information of 50,000 or more consumers, households or devices, by the way, includes also devices, could be part of the scope of the CCPA. Situation changes with um, 
the California Privacy Rights Act, um, they, they became a little bit more generous. So they're talking about gross revenues in excess of 25 million in the preceding calendar year. And they're talking about 100,000 or more consumers or households devices are already excluded. There is also another um, thing that we should mention that, for example, the business derives 50% or more of its annual revenues from selling consumer personal information. As you can see, there is a slight difference in the California Privacy Rights uh, Act, which talks about derives 50% or more of its annual revenues from selling or sharing consumer personal information. And when I talk about sharing, I uh, quite a lot refer to advertising. There is also in interesting difference in terms of consumer rights. There is consumer rights that are also introduced in the Virginia privacy law. One thing worth mentioning is the current rights of the individual, for example, to um, know what personal information is collected about this individual. All these rights, and again, I'm, I'm, I would like to repeat, are following the approach of the European General Data Protection Regulation of the European law. This is where this is coming from. Another law that also follows such approach is HIPAA, for example, for the rights of the individual. So where, where is the data of the individual? What you're doing with this data? How is it collected? Where is it disclosed? Are things that are important and are taken into consideration both by California Consumer Privacy Act and also by the California Privacy Rights Act, CPRA. Another, uh, another right that is essential is the right to access the personal information. This is the right of the individual to be able to see what personal information you have or you store about this individual and including maybe to ask you about a copy of this personal information which you should provide. Another, another right is the right to know if personal information is sold and the right to opt out of such sale. This continue to exist. However, with the CPRA, there is also additional requirement, which is the right to know what personal information is sold or shared and with whom, as well as the right to opt out of such sharing. Again, this refers a lot to advertising. The current law has the right to delete. It has the right to data portability. Data portability is a very interesting concept, which has been introduced by, again, European data protection law of personal information to be transferred from one entity to another entity upon request of the individual. You will see that there are new right that appears in the CPRA, which is the right to correct data, which is if my data is not accurate, I want this data to be changed. It also contains the right to data portability and it also includes the right to limit the use and disclosure of sensitive personal information. Sensitive personal information is, um, Again, a rather new concept for uh, California, but not so new concept worldwide. Uh, sensitive personal data exist a lot globally as a concept, which is certain personal information that has um, higher sensitivity in terms of how it's used, what it's done with it, where is it shared, how it is protected, um, and how it is disclosed. One just very brief example is our health data. But there are many other, um, there is a lot of other uh, data included into this concept. If we could move to the next slide. So I would like to continue with more changes. Um, as I already mentioned in the previous slide about uh, sale versus share, um, you can see that there is additional requirements of providing link on the web page that enables the consumers to, to, for their data not to be sold or shared. Um, this is actually quite important uh, and also the limit the use of the sensitive personal information. So there are additional restrictions to the sensitive personal information that I mentioned that basically enables the consumer to limit the use or the disclosure of, the, of his uh, personal information that could present higher uh, sensitivity. And another topic that I believe is very important is the enforcement. Um, it's very good that we have laws, but the question is whether they are enforced and to which extent they are enforced. Um, globally, um, there is a lot of enforcement going on lately. Huge fines are around the globe. 
Um, here, currently, CCPA is quite generous and provides 30 days to cure alleged non-compliance before being considered as a violation of the law. However, this no longer exists with the new law CPRA. They do not give a 30-day grace period for amendments related to, mi to minors. Another thing that it's important is the administrative enforcement for which I mentioned in the beginning of this discussion, which is the creation of the California Privacy Protection Agency for enforcement and guidance. This is a significant change. Um, in the United States, again, uh, the data protection agencies have have significant impact on, first of all, compliance with the laws in general and also enforcement, including data subject rights to a, to a significant extent around the globe or in relation to data breaches as well around the globe. So having a um, California Privacy Protection Agency that can look after how the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act uh, and CPRA is, um, you comply with it. I think that it's extremely uh, interesting uh, fact that I should mention. Otherwise, in terms of private right of action, basically any consumer who's non-encrypted or non-redacted personal information is subject to unauthorized access, theft or disclosure. Um, as a result of the business violation of the duty to implement and uh, maintain reasonable security procedures and practices may bring a civil action. There is a slight difference in the new law, which I want to mention. They also add email addresses with combination with a password or security question and answer that would permit access to the account is subject to unauthorized access and exfiltration. So there, um, there are slight changes. Uh, there are more changes, uh, which I will mention a bit later. For example, the introduction of security audits or review of the privacy practices of the organization, which are under the CPRA. And um, that's why security is so important and so much connected to privacy. And we have this discussion today. Thank you, Laura. So Marina, we have the GDPR, the CCPA, soon to have the CPRA. And as we saw from your map, many active and introduced bills could potentially rise to the level of past and therefore effective laws. So you know, what is the best approach that you can advise companies that are trying to comply with all these different types of state and, and other uh, types of data privacy laws? Uh, thank you so much. If we move to the next slide, uh, you will see a few tips that I uh, would like to mention uh, today. First of all, I, I fully agree with Laura. There is a lot of uh, companies with global presence, or even if it's not global presence, even if it's U.S. Uh, focused presence, it is still it is still complex because of these multiple local privacy laws. One thing that uh, I believe every company should, should start thinking about compliance with privacy is to focus on where is currently the data. It is very difficult to respond to a data subject request if you don't know where the data of that individual actually is. There is a very huge risk for um, properly handling a data breach or any type of security incident if you don't know where the data actually is and who could potentially access it. And this is where the data inventory and mapping um, comes. And it's extremely important way for you to verify where is the currently the data. And also um, this data inventory is not a static document. This is something, either a document or a tool, uh, both exist on the market, but data inventory and mapping is extremely important to verify where is the data going? And if there are any changes in your business practices, how these changes reflect the use of personal information and the storage of personal information and the access granted for uh, to this personal information. So data inventory and mapping is a definitely a global activity, something that can be done. Also rules can be created after the data inventory, let's say in the headquarters has been performed of how the subsidiaries abroad, if any, should handle that personal information. Another thing that is worth mentioning is uniform policies, processes, and procedures. If we could unify uh, what currently is in place and there is no patchwork on the basis of each law, and there are many things that could be unified, 
in terms of process in privacy, I, I strongly recommend that such a uniform approach is considered by the companies. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to track and monitor compliance with these policies is one thing. And also, it would be very difficult to understand the local requirements. One, for example, um, yeah, actually, example that I can give here is vendors. There are many different vendors, and maybe there should be some kind of a risk-based approach where, depending on to which extent such vendor has access to personal information, is to create a risk type questionnaires that are different for low risk versus high risk. So let's say vendors who are low risk don't have to comply with 300 questions, but vendors that are high risk you know, have to review 300 questions. I think that this could facilitate the process of onboarding of a vendor. And if you have these tiers of vendors, maybe it would be easier for you to track compliance for um, privacy and cybersecurity as well. Another, another uh, thing that I would like to mention is the uniform approach towards third parties, which I just discussed, and uniform training. I training looks a very simple task, but I believe the training is essential for compliance, both with privacy and cybersecurity. I believe Christian would uh, confirm training is extremely important. Um, if we don't have training, it is very difficult to educate the staff specifically of how they can handle personal information globally. Uh, and very often, part of the reason for non-compliance is internal, not necessarily coming from third parties. Very important thing that I wanted to mention uh, is the frameworks um, for to monitor privacy and security practices. As you can see, you have CCPA, you have CPRA, you have Virginia, you have the European privacy law, you have Brazilian privacy law, you have Korean privacy law. It is very difficult to com uh, comply with all the laws. And that's why I would suggest to start with uniform framework that basically talks about the baseline of privacy and what every company should have, no matter which law applies. To which extent that can go into detail, for example, in relation to data subject rights could be verified later, but for you to understand where you're currently standing, compliance with uh, frameworks like NIST, which I, I mean, I highly recommend, I mean, we are using a lot NIST, ISO as well, uh, specifically NIST and ISO in relation to privacy are very interesting frameworks that are uniform frameworks. ISO very much focused on GDPR. NIST is very broad and general framework with over 100 controls that can uh, assist you with um, in, in relation to implementation of your current privacy posture. So you can see where your gaps are and create a strategy. This is another thing that I didn't mention in this slide but strategy of how to approach privacy is essential. And this strategy should be based on both the current privacy posture of the company on the basis of, let's say, one of these frameworks, but also on the basis of your business plans and the upcoming year and current mar uh, market presence. Same uh, applicable for uh, cybersecurity in relation to use of personal information, both NIST, ISO, and also SOC, they all provide a certain current uh, framework of cybersecurity as NIST also overlaps privacy and cybersecurity in terms of uh, controls to a certain extent. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Marina. That's, that's a lot of content, but um, really excellent thoughts there. I just wanna pause here and remind the audience that we encourage you to submit questions for any of the speakers. And uh, as you're doing that, we will segue to talk a little bit about some more general regulatory changes, starting with what has become a very hot topic in the investment management industry, and that's ESG. So we'll turn to Sean now. And um, Sean, can you tell us a little bit about what to consider in terms of um, ESG oversight? Sure, yeah, absolutely. And thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, certainly happy to be here. Uh, so this is an area where we are fielding questions almost daily from virtually every type of advisor on the spectrum. So that includes everything from hedge, private equity, wealth managers, crypto venture, you name it, they're interested and, and everyone's asking about it. So uh, in many situations, however, most advisors don't even know what they're asking and where to, where to start. They only know that they want to be involved in it in, in some way, shape or another. 
Uh, and so while ESG has been, been around for a number of years, I think the maturation of the US market certainly lags our European uh, counterparts by several years. Uh, and we've only really recently seen wholesale adoption of ESG and socially responsible investing principles. So uh, I think in the US, uh, largely driven by investor demand, including everyone from you know, your institutional allocators right down to your millennial retail investors with the Robinhood account. I think you know, advisors are clamoring to position their firms and their strategies accordingly. So the unfortunate side of this is that many of those same managers lab labeling themselves with this coveted ESG uh, tag fail to properly define their guiding principles and adopt proper protocols to ensure compliance with those investor representations. Uh, so, you know, it, it, to frame it in, in a regulatory perspective, if an advisor makes a fa false ESG claim, pretty much like anything else, uh, thereby inducing investors to either invest or remain invested in a particular product or strategy, you know, the SEC can bring charges under their uh, under anti-fraud provisions. Uh, in effect, it's it's really no different than being prosecuted for you know inflated performance numbers. Uh, and you know, similarly, there are um, liability concerns when it comes to uh, investors or clients that uh, that are claiming reliance as well. Uh, so this is where a subject matter that's rooted in the investment side of the business uh, becomes a compliance issue and thus an area uh, of concern for the, for the staff, which we saw the SEC uh, tout in a risk alert that came out earlier this year. Um, you know, personally, I doubt that we're going to see a substantive regulation directly, directly, directly governing ESG activities and reporting like we saw the SFDR. Uh, coming out in Europe, uh, but we we know it's going to be a focus under existing rules, and this is a, a subject matter that is is here and here to stay longer term. Uh, in my opinion, the biggest problem with ESG uh, compliance relates to the fact that you have a largely largely numbers based industry attempting to assign quantitative measures to an inherently qualitative topic. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to it, it comes down to it, uh, advisors really need to put a lot of thought into what ESG means to them, how it translates when applied to their specific portfolios, how they're going to develop and source metrics and analytics, whether that's on a security level or an issuer level, uh, whether that's via insourcing or outsourcing, you know, need to figure out what type of screening tools they have, what type of reporting systems and oversight uh, measures they're going to install. Uh, they also need to figure out what type of firm training, right? If you have, you know, the front of the house that's you know, drafting a policy, you need to make sure that the investment professionals are adhering to it and there's proper checks and balances from, you know, your back and middle office to ensure that you are actually being in compliance. Um, so I think that governance mechanism really needs to be thought out at the onset so that you can actually make good on your promises. Um, I think managers also need to be realistic about the, uh, the limitations unique to either them as a firm or their strategy. So for instance, if you have a private market strategy, uh, you had better be prepared to set up those pipes and do the fundament fundamental research on your portfolio companies and figure out how you're actually reporting and analyzing that data, presenting it to, to investors or LPs. Um, uh, to again, make sure that you're, you're in full adherence with those, with those upfront reps and covenants. Uh, if you run a fixed income solution, you need to be mindful that a lot of the traditional data sources uh, for equity managers like a Bloomberg or MSCI don't necessarily have the same coverage for you know, less prominent uh, asset classes, even though you know, the market caps for some of those may be pretty substantial. Um, similarly, if you are allocating to managers that tout ESG or SRI as you know, the pillars of their investment strategy, you, there's going to be an obligation that you're conducting diligence on how they're defining ESG and how they're actually adhering and complying to it. So you know, the, as part of your fiduciary duty, you're going to have to go that extra step of verification. Uh, I don't think that a regulator is just going to allow you to accept you know, those reps on, on the face. So really, my takeaway from this slide is, uh, is you know, to put together, uh, put a lot of thought into how you define ESG, how you're going to implement initial and continuing monitoring of your portfolio, how you're going to foster transparency and reporting to investors, and really, again, how you're going to be able to demonstrate to the SEC when they ask questions that you're living up to those, um, those statements and representations. That's great. And I think there's some sentiment out there that we should expect to see increased examination activity, at least at the SEC over the next few years. So 
Can you give us some tips for managing that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, um, I would say that the first half of uh, 2021 has been what I would consider the most active exam season I've seen in my career. Uh, uh, that includes both in terms of the occurrence of exams, as well as the expanded scope of the staff's reviews. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the industry sentiment is that this could be an indicator of what's to come over the remaining three and a half years under the uh, Biden administration. Uh, personally, I'm cautiously optimistic that we won't see a full reversion to the broken windows uh, approach under the Mary Jo White uh, SEC. Um, however, I feel that heightened regulatory scrutiny is, a, is an almost certainty at this point. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, weathering an exam on SCADE really comes down to one thing, and that's preparation. Um, you know, obviously, this may seem somewhat self-serving since this is our business, but things like mock, ex mock exams and readiness exercises can be hugely helpful for folks who are either unfamiliar with the audit, audit process or just not uh, in touch with, you know, recent trends and, and hot, uh, hot topics for the SEC. And those can be done either by bringing in outside parties or just availing yourself of the, uh, the, all the resources that are, avail are available publicly. I'd say that even for those that are uh, that know what to expect in broad strokes, going through the mechanics of re responding to a request letter, repurposing data into the SEC's preferred formats, sitting through interviews, making sure that you nail the narrative and limit the scope of an inquiry is key. Um, let alone, you know, if those exercises actually yield substantive compliance issues that are uh, that would otherwise be identified and brought to your attention by the SEC. It's it's good to be able to proactively remediate rather than be on the defensive for when the staff um, walks in your hypothetical door, although on sites are still not a thing for the foreseeable future. Um, and, you know, also, again, make sure that every, that you're informed as to what the staff is fo focusing on. It's not difficult to, um, to understand what the SEC is looking at these days with the publication of their annual priorities list, countless risk alerts, coverage of enforcement actions, in addition to you know, SEC releases, there is an abundance of content from law firms, consulting firms, and of course, you know, trade groups like the IAA. Uh, so everyone should make sure to educate themselves. Um, we know the SEC loves to gather facts about industry responses to new and emerging issues. Uh, so it makes, it makes sense to get ahead of them. Um, and whether that's, you know, for instance, the, the disruption caused by Hurricane Sandy a few years ago on the East Coast, the wildfires in California, or I don't know, a global pandemic. Um, you know, we know the SEC is asking questions about your, your responses and what you've done to bolster things like business continuity uh, and cybersecurity and the like. So, you know, it makes sense to be proactive, put together a narrative um, and, you know, be able to demonstrate to the SEC that you're doing exactly what you should be. Uh, the big thing is that you don't, you absolutely do not have to be perfect. And frankly, no one should expect a no findings letter going through an exam, although I think that's actually been more common uh, recently due to some of these limited scope exercises that are, are you know, um, increasing in popularity. Um, but the important thing is that you're constantly self assessing, driving improvement wherever possible. And in many respects, the SEC is looking for that process as much as the end result. So, you know, keep that top of mind. And related to exams, sometimes, unfortunately, is enforcement. Um, so uh, let me turn to your thoughts on that. But first, another reminder to please send any questions through the chat. We'd love to answer some audience questions. Yeah, so obviously those tips and tricks for navigating an exam are kind of the threshold recommendation for surviving a, uh, a more enforcement-centric uh, more enforcement -centric environment, uh, given that if you make it through an exam without any material findings, you're going to inf uh, avoid enforcement. Um, but you know, the key here is really uh, avoiding two things. One is recidivism, the other is complacency. On the first point, it's very straightforward. If the SEC found something during a prior exam and you committed to fixing it, make sure it's been done and been done to completion. I'd say making false promises to the staff and failing to make good on them puts you on the fast track of enforcement, even when it doesn't involve investor harm. Uh, on the, the second issue of complacency, I'd say far too often firms fail to recognize that they've fallen behind uh, the market in a given area, which really leaves them exposed, especially when it involves an area that could give rise to uh, to investor losses. So 
you know, look at your policies, what's in there and why. Just because it was, it was best practice five years ago doesn't mean that it still is today. Are there things in there that you're doing that, that you say you're doing that, you know, you're really not doing to its full extent as drafted? Um, have, you, have there been evolutions in your business model that, you know, necessitated additional or uh, changes to your policies? Um, have your policies evolved to adapt to new rules, SEC focus areas, or just rule interpretations? Do you have a testing program in place where you're really self-policing? Uh, so think of that in terms of first, second, and third line defense, where you have, you know, the, the primary, the person who sits at the primary function, then you have compliance as second, and then uh, a quasi uh, internal audit that oversees that. Uh, also, you know, are you mapping out your risks? Have you reconciled them against your policies? Do you do you put enough resources into those um, those areas that you consider relatively high risk? And do you know what your peers are doing? The truth is that all firms are benchmarked against similarly situated advisors uh, in terms of size, strategy, and and the like. So you never want to appear behind the curve. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, if there's a component of your business model that falls into a you know regulatory gray area in, in air quotes, uh, which for the vast majority of firms, the answer is yes, at least in some regard. Um, you know, are you constantly revisiting and bolstering your disclosures? Uh, the good news for the advisory community is that U.S. securities laws are disclosures dis <clears throat> disclosure based. So if you can if you can add um, supplementary disclosures in your form ADD, advisory agreements, fund offering documents, DDQs, even ad hoc investor notifications, I think that can go a long way to insulating yourself from potentially from potential scrutiny down the road. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is that you know, as a general matter, we've seen a convergence of compliance operations. Uh, and finance. So to the extent that you can inter you can bolster internal processes in these, uh, ancillary yet related functions that weren't historically considered compliance, you know, I think that's also in everyone's best interest. Common ones here are, you know, things like cash controls, valuation, corporate actions, trade reconciliation, <clears throat> right? Those weren't necessarily core compliance, although compliance had to ensure that you had to process in place. Um, now, I think the expectation is that you're going the extra step to verify that <clears throat> others within your organization are actually doing what you're what they're supposed to be. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sean. We have a couple of extra minutes. Christian, um, Marina, do you have anything else you wanted to add? I haven't seen any questions come in. If not, I think we'll wrap up there. So I'd like to thank Christian Kelly from Xantrion, Marina Tescova from Armanino LLP, and Sean Wilkie from Grayline and GCM Advisory very much for your expertise and taking the time to speak to our members. And a special thank you to Xantrion for sponsoring today's webinar. Have a great day.